everybody and a very warm welcome. And uh, sincere thanks to Philip Reed, President of the Brown Reed Society of Zimbabwe, for stimulating this, for pushing this. We started last year in October. This is just an introductory course into what we expect back from the stud breeders to make sure, uh, as uh, Philip mentioned at the beginning, uh, that all the data is up to speed and uh, we are indeed in the business of stud breeding um, and everything is up to speed. So the first thing I just want to touch on, ZHB, what is ZHB? So Z Zimbabwe Herd Book is the data registry maintaining the herd books on behalf of all the breed societies. So the breed societies all have constitutions, all have bylaws that fit under the overarching constitution and bylaws of the Zimbabwe herd book. And they dictate what a stud animal is, what are the requirements for an animal to enter the herd book, what are the requirements for the animal to stay in the herd book, to be moved, to be upgraded, whatever. And basically, we maintain the herd book on behalf of, all, of the respective breed societies according to those rules and regulations. And to do this, we have uh, arguably the world's leading software to support us. And the software is called ILR2 International Livestock Registry Version 2. Uh, and it's an animal oh, it's it's an animal registry service providing for data recording maintenance inquiry and reporting it is developed by ABRI agricultural business research in, in, institute in australia which is closely uh, allied to the university of armadale where uh, the, one of the top animal breeding houses in the world is. And, and then we've got uh, this um, software called Breed Plan on, the, on taking data from here and this is providing us with modern genetic evaluation system for cattle breeders and all the data that is analyzed is recorded in ILR2. So what is the herd book and how do animals get into the herd book? So firstly is, is birth. So when a birth is notified, it comes into the system. But these are not registered. They are birth notified. I am notifying the herd book of this birth to registered parents already in the herd book. Okay? And they, are, they first go into what is called the calf book birth notification and we'll go into more detail in this down the road when we inspect an animal then an animal moves from calf book into herd book and now it's registered okay and any animals that fail are downgraded to commercial they can still be on your herd they can still be alive okay And the key thing is we can also transfer animals from one stud breeder to another. And here the seller must authorize a transfer. Okay. And we also facilitate transfers, international transfers from sister registering authorities. And to do that, we need the registration certificate from the country of origin with the animal details. Uh, to be sent to ZHB and telling us that this animal has moved from stud breeder in, in South Africa to a breeder in Zimbabwe. And when we are presented with that, we can uh, then authentically move that animal from the South African stud book into the Zimbabwean stud book. And if we can get data extracts, uh, that makes the... Um, Population, populating the database much easier because we will populate up to three generations of breeding. And then, of course, 
So you've got animals coming in, birth notifications, cancellate, um, uh, transfers, but also we now have a process of cancellations for a variety of reasons. I've downgraded it to commercial, it died, I sold it to, uh, to a commercial breeder, okay, and these we can also cause disposal of fates, and very simply, a fate code, one is died, the date, and you send it to ZHB, we, we, we put that into the database, and the status of the animal is upgraded. The animal remains on the database, but it's no longer active. And the other way an animal can enter the herd book is through an Appendix A, depending on the rules and regulations of the separate herd books. Okay? And an Appendix A animal is an animal that is born to at least one commercial or unknown parent. Uh, it's first birth notified as commercial, and after inspection, it can enter the herd book as an Appendix A if your breed society has an upgrading system. Okay, so that's very general what the herd book is. We'll now go into some more details on how it works. And the very first thing is the system of animal identification. Very, very important. Okay, and it's exactly the same with your national registration. Okay. When your birth is notified, the first thing you do is you get a national registration number, and that remains with you for life. This is the same thing here, the system of animal identification. It must be a unique number in Zimbabwe, and is used to identify that animal and all its movements and all its activities. It is also known as the society ID, and the format is very simple. It's two digits for the year of birth, four digits, zero padded for the number, tag number within year of birth, and then up to three letters being your herd designation letters. And we give an example there, 210036 ABC. So typically, this would mean an animal born in 2021, it's number 36 in 2021, so you need a unique tag number within year, and it's zero padded for the computer, okay, it's always four digits, zero padded, and, um, and then we have up to three letters being the herd designation letters. So the herd designation letters are very, very important. When you register your stud, there are two key fields. The prefix, being the stud name, and, um, and your HDL, herd designation letters. So the prefix identifies your stud. Read Brahmins, holistic Changani and Kornis, so on. Okay? The HDL oh, is three letters that are unique, up to three letters that are unique in Zimbabwe that are associated with each ID. Okay, so anything with ABC is in that stud. So when you register, you need to think about the HDL because not only is it uh, part of the ID on the computer, but you can also legally put the HDL brand on the animal. Okay? And typically, you'll see on the left leg, uh, a hind leg. Uh, so, Reed Brahmins is R E E, and you'll often find Mr. Reed identifies all his Brahmins with an R E E, and then he will have two digits for the year and Two digit, uh, the tag number, he won't put, and he will brand that on the animal. You can do that. Okay. So the tag number on the animal doesn't have to have all the zeros and everything. That is the computer number or that is the electronic number. But you need to show 
2136 and ABC on the animal somehow. Okay, are we all clear? And please, this is a lecture, a lecture, a classroom tile lecture, but I want to keep it open. At any point, if there's any point of clarification, please, please stop me. Yes, ma'am. Not only Brahmin breeders. This is in the constitution of the ZHB, and it is in the constitution of every breed society. Every animal needs to be identified by two means. Why? If you lose one of the means, you can still identify it. And you have several combinations. You can use a tattoo, you can use a brand, you can use ear tags or you can use ear notches. And basically we want to know the year, the tag number, and where possible the HDL. Okay? This, this is very key. Okay? Just as, for example, your vehicles in this country are all registered with the number plate, well most of them are, <laughs> with the number plate, with the chassis number, with the engine number. Okay? And it goes with every vehicle. It's the same thing with stud breeding. The animal must be clearly identified with at least two means. And I've just given an example where you can have uh, ABC 2136. You can have that on the tag. You can have that tattooed. You can have the, the 21 and 36 notched on the animal and or branded. Thank you, Mike. That's a very, very key important, and it is critically important that every animal is easily identified by at least two means. Okay? Now, the animal name. When you birth notify an animal, it will automatically be given a name, which is made up of the stud, read Brahmins, and the farm ID, 20, 2136. Okay? You can also give it a name. Okay? Fred, whatever. Okay? You can do that. The system will accommodate that. Okay? So in the, in, in the past, particularly, people used to give every animal names, and a lot of breeders still do, especially in the, in the, in the dairy. They still give a name. So that name can go as part of the animal name that will appear on its certificate. So the Shangani, Holistic, Inkornis, the ID, and you can have a name. Okay. National ID. So if you are using the Zimbabwe Cattle Traceability System with the national ID, this is optional. And we do uh, market the tags with a unique code on the tags. And that, tag, that code can also be populated into the birth notification where you show the national ID. So now, birth notifications. Probably the most important step. Getting animals into the system. This is the first step. We need to make it right. We need to make it right the first time. Okay? And this is where we are tripping up. And this is where we need your help to make sure we get it straight. So, birth notifications. When the animal is born, what do we want? So, we want some details of the calf. It's society ID. The ID that we've been talking about. Date of birth, its sex, what is its appendix, and a name, if you have a name, optional. Mating details, if you don't give us anything, we assume it's natural. If it's artificial insemination, you tell us AI and we want the date. Key, what's the ID of the sire? In that society ID format. Please don't tell us Peter. Okay, We want the society ID because that is what we use to recognize the animals. And the, the sire and the dam 
needs to be in the database, you put it in there and you submit that, and the computer will pick up the sire and dam and allocate that calf to that sire, to that dam automatically, and carry out a whole bunch of checks, which we'll come on to just now. The breed code, and then calving details. Number in birth, single twin, mostly single. Birth weight, uh, encourage everybody to seriously consider capturing birth weight and submitting that. Very, very important measure. It tells us a lot about uh, that animal. Not only its birth weight, but also it gives us some indicator of its mature weight. It gives us a lot of measurements. And we will come back to that. But as, as, as your president of the Brahmin Society said a moment ago, stud breeding is about performance recording. It's about records. Okay? And this is the start. Well, this is the start. As we, as we get a calving detail, we are starting to get fertility measures on the, on the dam, on the sire. But we're now starting to get a birth weight. The other key thing is performance group. Now, we'll come a little bit later to this to, to, to discuss contemporary groups. But contemporary group is a definition that we give to identify a group of commonly treated animals. This is very, very important. Because when we talk about performance records, we evaluate the performance of an individual relative to his contemporaries. So we need to make sure we've identified that contemporary group. And in terms of birth notifications, the performance group that we are concerned about is not the calf, but it's a dam. For example, if we have a herd where the heifers calve close to the homestead and they've got extra grazing and the cows calve somewhere else. We are looking after the heifers. We want to make sure they're calving down easily and we're giving them extra food. We are treating the heifers different to the main calving group. So you need to indicate the heifers, and all, you can use anything. You can use a 1 to indicate a heifer, or you can use an H to indicate a heifer group. And all that's doing is telling the, um, the guys who are analyzing, well, it's really software. We load the data onto the software, but straight away the software can identify that this calf came from a heifer that has been treated differently from this calf that came from a cow. Therefore, treat them, analyze them as two separate groups. They're all analyzed together, but one is a heifer calving group and the other is your cow calving group. Okay? We'll come back to that because that's a key understanding in terms of performance recording. And then birth fate. Within 48 hours of birth. Abortion. We want abortions. We want stillbirths because that is a fertility record. Okay? For whatever reason, we don't know why the cow aborted or the calf was born still, but we want that information, okay? And we also cater for birth fate up to 48 hours, where the calf died within 48 hours of birth. You can put all of that information into what we call the birth notifications. Now, the most important thing is the birth notifications must be with us within 60 days. Ladies and gentlemen, this is in the constitution of the ZHP and it is in your society constitution. Births must be registered within 60 days. Why? Because there are so many events tied to that birth. And if you delay on that, it messes everything up. And it messes up the integrity of the data. Okay? Because as I mentioned, the minute an animal is born, what happens? It's birth notified. We link that to that cow. This cow has now given birth. This sire has now given birth. And there's a whole bunch of checks. Was the cow alive at the time of birth? Was it present in your herd at the time of mating? Was the sire alive at the time of mating? Was the sire in your herd at the time of mating? Okay, all these checks, and that's why we want this within 60 days, so that we can carry out these checks, tidy up, 
giving me a birth at the time when you're selling an animal after inspection creates a real issue. Because now I need to go back, try and birth notify this animal 18 months uh, earlier. What's the status of the dam? I might need to reinstate the dam to put the birth on and all this kind of mess. Okay, and there's a number of other things that go along with that birth notification, which we'll discuss. So we are starting to hammer on this. Birth notifications must be with this within 60 days. After 60 days, penalties kick in. There are big penalties. I think it's two dollars from 60 days to 90 days. It's five dollars 90 to. Uh, 180 days and after 180 days we charge you $10 plus an inspection we hammer you not because we're trying to be funny but because this is such a key event and we want that data in as soon as possible okay this is where we are tripping and this is one of the big things that causes uh, problems in the integrity of the data okay and then there are so many ways you can submit your data to us. We have an on-farm program which we call Herdmaster, which is a very, very nice piece of software. And uh, I welcome you all to look at it. Uh, if you're interested, just send us an email. We'll send you all the links. You can load it. You've got 45 days to look at it. It's a very powerful on-farm software. And it does a lot of things. And it just helps you for day-to-day -day management. I am not trying to sell it to you to say you must get it. If you are going to use this for on-farm management, please consider it. But don't buy it to send me data. That's, that's, sending the data is one of the functions of the database. Okay. But Hodemaster is a very, very nice, powerful on-farm management tool with, with a, a lot of functions. And that's a topic for an, uh, another course, which we will be giving. We also have a very simple Excel template. And you should have all received emails. And we will continue sending you emails with a very simple Excel tem template, which caters for all of this. Across society ID, date of birth, sex, you just put them in. There's lots of decent notes. And you send us that, that um data on your Excel template and the beauty about that is we don't touch the data. We pick it up, we load it on the front end of the software and it sucks the data in. Remember, errors in transcription, okay? There's a, you've got your, your stockman on the farm, he's writing down this calf number to this cow. He may have written it down wrong. He then gives it to you. You may have written it down wrong in putting it there. And of course, if you give it to us in hard copy, we may have written it down wrong in putting it. So the closer we can get to the source of the data, so if we can get the Excel template or the Herdmaster data direct from the farmer, there's no... And you will pick up the errors quicker than us. How are we to know there's a difference between cow 5 and cow 10? You will know cow 10 doesn't exist. Or whatever. You see what I'm trying to say? You are more familiar with your data than, than we are. And so you, if you give it to us in this template, we load it and it goes through the system. Of course, you can do a hard copy. And uh, we do have hard copy birth notification books. I was meant to bring a whole bunch today with me. But if you're interested in them, we have hard copy books that capture all that information. And you can also use that. Okay. And while I'm there, you should have your own system of recording. And that's maybe another slide, Craig, that we need to bring in here. To me, the most important document on the farm is that little calf book, which is in your foreman's pocket, which has all the birth details. From there, it should go into a calf, note, a calf book on farm, and then it gets captured onto your herdmaster or Excel template. So you should always have that backup. Okay, so that's a slide we need to put in there. The records on farm. 
Multi-size. I just want to touch on multi-size because this is important. A lot of people do use multi-size. What does multi-size mean? It means I've got two or more bulls running with a group of cows. So when the calf is born, the sire could have been, and sorry, that multi-sire slide is not in your notes. We slipped it in uh, on, the, on the way down yesterday, but we realized that this is quite an important topic. So what it means is when the calf is born, you don't know who the sire is. Okay. So if you do use multi size before the calf is born, you must generate a multi sire code. And you can do that yourself, or you can write to us and we'll generate it for you. And basically, you tell us uh, what bulls are running with the group, and then you can make it up. It's made up of your HDL, ABC, a year identifier, MOLT, multi-sire, and a multi-sire group within year. You might have three multi-sire groups. Okay? So group 1 has sire 1 and 2. Group 2 has sire 3 and 4. And that is the sire ID. You will put that there against the birth notification. So we would have already loaded that multi sire group with bull one or bull two. So when that calf is born and we get that information in, the system already knows that's one or two bulls. Okay? Are we all happy on that? So. Please sort this out before the calves are born. Notify the ZHB of the multi sire ID and the bulls. And create an ID for that multi sire group. Please use a new one for each year, even if you're using the same bulls. And the appendix calculation is totally dependent on the breed society rules. Now, you've sent us this birth. And we've come up with a problem. And we will come up, and so the system, what it will do is it will not load this birth automatically. It will hold it and generate a request for information. So basically, we've, we've presented uh, this, this birth notification to the computer, and the computer is saying, there's a problem here. For a variety of reasons, and we'll touch on some of them. So it will say, okay, I know you've tried to enter this birth, but I'm going to hold it to the side. And I'm going to give it an ID, question mark 001. And I will assign that question mark to the cow. So I know there's a, a, a calf pending against the cow. Okay? But there's a problem that needs to be tidied up. And where do the problems come? The dam was fated. So you might have told me the dam died. Could it be an error? Could be. But in my system, the dam's dead. Now we're trying to re uh, record a calf against it. One of the parents is missing. One of the parents is not on the database. You've put a sire ID there that doesn't exist on the database. The calving interval is too short. The calf two weeks ago and is calving again. System saying, no, 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 no. Can't be. Okay? One of the parents hasn't passed inspections. We'll come back to inspections. Okay, remember at the beginning I told you when you birth notify, it goes into CB, calf birth. Okay? It's not registered. We cannot uh, assign progeny to a parent that is not in the registered herd book. It's in the calf book. Okay, so it needs to be inspected to move from CB to reg. So these are a number of, of issues. Okay? So what happens is the system automatically kicks back an RFI, a request for information, and it tells you why the animal is being held. We will send this back to you. Please, please treat this urgently. Because remember I told you the birth notification is one of the keys the key step to tidying up and ensuring the data integrity. So when we throw that back to you, study it and tell us what's going on. 
oh, I'm sorry, I, got, I gave you the wrong damn ID. It shouldn't be 21, it should be 12. I'm sorry, the dam didn't die, it's still alive, whatever, okay? But we need to know what's going on so that we can resolve the issue and the animal can go through as a CB, a calf birth, birth notified. Okay, while it's held, it's in limbo, okay? So the animal doesn't exist, there's a whole bunch of things that don't exist. Please register with Craig and get some notes. Yes, sir. Yes. Can an animal carry a multiplier in its pedigree? Excellent question. I don't know if everybody heard that. So I've birth notified an animal. And it's got a multi-sire ID. Can that multi-sire ID stay with the animal for its life? Excellent question. And that is something that we need the societies to tidy up. It's really a society-based rule. Will they accept an animal in the herd book with multi-sire ID? So some societies saying, uh, Boran, for example, at inspection, you make sure you send your samples to a lab and get it DNA verified so we know exactly until we can pass. Others say we will, we will allow it, but we will drop it. If it was SP, we drop it one or two appendixes down. So it's a breed society thing. We are moving towards, uh, most of the societies are moving towards demanding that any multi-sire at inspection uh, gets progeny of verified and you identify the sire. Thank you, sir. Very good question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So that's, that's a, and it's a very good thing to understand. So a sire can be a natural or can be AI. And we need to know natural or AI. And if it's AI, we need to know there is semen. But a very good point. And so that, you know, if we don't know, the system, well, you mean, remember, it's just a computer software. And it's going saying, mm, this animal sold, couldn't, couldn't have been bred. But so it, its semen should have been registered. Craig, do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, what if you basically determine that semen has been taken from the sire and therefore can be used as an AI uh, tool? So there's a lot of these mating variables correct. The system should have checked. So, but thanks, Craig. Just, just note that. Maybe we can uh, send out a memo to people to how to re properly, properly register semen. Thank you. Thank you. Very simple. Very simple. Yeah. Sales. Again, this is not in your notes. Something we thought about yesterday to add in. And again, it's thanks to uh, Philip Reed. We've tripped up not only Brahmins, but many places where animals are being sold as a stud pedigree or registered animal but it doesn't exist in ZHB 
or its status is not clear. So what we are demanding, please, from now on, before, before you advertise any animal for sale that you're saying is stud, registered, or pretty, because the minute you use those words, it means it's registered with ZHP. So before you do any sale like that, please get a clearance letter from ZHP. It's very simple. You write to send an email to Trace. Uh, so Trace, T-R-A-C-E, at L-I-T, dot C-O, dot Z-W, goes to all the data staff in the office. Okay? A lot of people say, dear Tracy, there is no body called Tracy. It's just Trace, and it goes to Z-H, for Z-H-B staff immediately. And all you do is you list the animals. Please confirm these animals are fully are, are properly uh, registered and eligible for sale. That's it. Okay? And we will very quickly make sure, yes, we have received the birth. We've had instances where an animal has been sold and hasn't been birth notified. Again, it goes back to that data integrity. Now we're trying to capture things in retrospect. It's untidy. It's messy. Okay? And the data integrity is not there. Do we know the siren dam? Do we have a DNA sample? Uh, has it been inspected if it's past a certain age? We can also regi uh, generate registration certificates for you for inspected animals. Okay. All we're asking is please, before you sell an animal, make sure its, uh, its status is square. Now, if you're getting your regular levy lists and herd lists, all the data is there. And if you see it's there and it's rage, it's cool. Okay? We're just asking for the steps of, we, we've had a number of public auctions where people are saying, I've got some stud animals. Stud means registered. Okay? And that's all we're saying. And we're trying to protect everybody in the, in the business. The ZHB, the breeder, uh, the breed, and the seller, uh, and the buyer. Because the last thing we want is a buyer coming to ZHB and saying, I want the certificate. Okay. Right, cancellations. So how do we remove the animals from the, um, from the herd book? Well, not remove, we deactivate them. No animals deleted. It's just a status. It's no longer an active animal. It's an inactive animal. So... We have a number of fate or disposal codes, and these are the typical ones, one under their codes. One for death, two theft, three cow fertility, four cow for other reasons, five sale to a non-ZH member, six movement to a commercial herd. Okay? So you just give me the ID of the animal, its um, code, and the date, and again, any one of those three methods, it's a very simple thing. We've got a template for births, for cancellations, for performance records. It's a very simple Excel template. You don't need any fancy software. And you submit that, and we load that onto the database. And, of course, if there's any queries, we come back to you. Otherwise, the animals move from active to inactive. Finish. Okay. Now we move on to, after, after birth notifications, probably the second most important topic, performance records. This is what stud breeding is about. Okay. And I like to give the example that I used at the, the Shangani Field Day recently. Uh, what's the difference between a stud animal and any other animal? And the stud animal has some information about it has some information about its breeding and it has some information about its performance. So I give the example, I'm going to uh, an auction to buy a pickup and there's two Toyota vans there, both 20, 20, uh, 2010, they're both what, 12 year old vans, they're both white, they both look in similar condition, they sound the same, they look okay. The one, no papers, Apart from the registration book. The other one gives me the full list. Who owned it? What service intervals? When the timing belt was changed? 
Everything is there. Okay, now they're being auctioned. Am I going to pay the same price for both? Or am I willing to pay a little bit more for the one for the, with the full performance? Nobody's saying that the one with the performance records is better than the one without the performance records. It's just that you have some history. Okay, so this is exactly what stud breeding is about. When I come to buy a stud animal, there's something behind that animal telling me a little bit about how it's going to breed based on its, based on its pedigree and based on its performance records. So, I touched on this before and I now go into more detail. Contemporary blue. This is the most important concept to understand when we discuss performance records. Because when we analyze the performance of an individual, we compare it to his or her contemporaries. Okay? And then we bring in all the other information. Okay. So typically, uh, we look at animals born close to each other, 45 to 60 days of each other, within the same herd, within the same year, within the same sex, and your performance management group that I talked about earlier on. So I've got a group of calves, and the, the one group is being fed extra to the other group. So I need to indicate these are getting extra food to those. Okay? And so these are, so the, the ones are standard. I mean, the computer automatically calculates the 45, 60 day splice. It automatically identifies separate herd, separate year sex, sex group. But now it's dependent on you to tell us, no, no, out of these 20 calves, these 10 belong into group 1 and these 10 belong into group 2 for whatever reason. Got extra feed, uh, whatever. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'll give some examples. There's, it was sick, got extra feed, different location. I mentioned the heifers calving down in one area and the cows in another. You might manage the, the, the cow herd in two groups. So you need group one and group two. Okay? You don't try and compare them when they're on very different uh, farms with very different grazing, water, whatever. It's two different groups because remember... We compare the performance of an individual to his contemporaries. So we often get, when we talk about performance evaluation and um, generating estimated breeding values, a lot of people say to us, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, my, uh, you can't compare that Mashana breeder who's got uh, Mashanga and got all of that, his calves, to my calves in Matabili land. Um, you know, I'm much drier, I don't have the feed resources, I don't get uh, 240 kg wiener weights, I'm getting 180, and you're putting me at a disadvantage. No. We look at the relative performance of that animal to his contemporaries, and we look at that deviation. Is he 10 kgs better than his group? And that's all we look at. Okay. But it depends on properly identifying that contemporary group. So, what performance records do we have? We've already talked about weight, birth weight, within 24 hours. It's a very important measure. It tells me a lot about the mature weight of the animal, uh, and which also tells me a lot about how big uh, he will be in maturity, how big his... Daughters will be, so birth weight, just that birth weight tells me a lot. Okay? Ooh. What we call 200 day or W2 or pre-weaning weight. So this is a weight anywhere between 80 and 300 days before the calf is removed from the cow. So it's a weight of the animal while it's still suckling. Okay, and this weight is different to the other weights because we try and separate this weight to try and get the growth of the calf. So he got genes from his mother, he got genes from his father. What is the growth of this calf plus any beneficial extra that he got from the mother for milk? 
Okay, and what is the genetic disposition of the cow to give extra milk? So that's a complex trait, so we can start splitting it. So that's why we want to measure it before the calf is taken away from the mother. Then the other big one is your yearling weight, W4. And you've got quite a large range of ages. And again, the W6, quite a large range. The W6 is being 18 months, which is also what they call final weight, because that's the weight that typically you will turn them out into a feedlot, and that's why they call it a final weight. So it's those four weights which tell us a lot about that animal. And then there's two other important weights. Weighted calving. When the, uh, the cow's weight, when her calf is born, or what, what were you saying that they, you thought it was useful? Milk, yeah, thank you. We, we think they, they can suck this into looking at milk. But the other really good one to consider is cow weight when the W2, the calf weight, is taken. This gives us a very good measure of mature weight. This is a very, very important trait to consider because mature weight is very closely related to adaptability and fertility on your farm. So... Go back to this contemporary group. Okay? Ideally, all animals in the same performance group should be weighed on the same day. Please don't weigh uh, group 1 today and group 2 tomorrow. The computer will recognize two different dates and treats us as group 1 and group 2 if all the calves are in a group. If they're all in a group, weigh them one day. Bang. So... If you, if you whatever reason can't weigh them on the same day and you weigh the next day with the same day as that. Yeah, that's that was just picked up by Julia. Okay. Our farm is practical size. Okay. Uh, yeah. But the computer if there's a different date, the computer recognizes and treats it. This is a number game. Performance recording is a numbers game. I keep telling you that we look at the performance of an individual relative to his group. Now, if I've got three animals, okay, birth weight, and I've got one of 31 kgs, one of 30 kgs, one of 29 kgs, so the average is 30 kgs. I'm going to be comparing 31 to 30 is plus 1, 29 to 30 is minus 1, and 30 to 30 is 0. It's a very tight group and it doesn't give me a lot of information. But if I've got 30 calves in that group, then I've got more information. So you want as many animals as possible in as tightly managed group as possible. Please, to the nearest KD, KG. Now, we can submit two weights for each trait and the computer will allow that and take it into account, which allows for any uh, abnormal variances in the two weights. So if we, for example, um, carve from late, if we've got a, a typical March to uh, December to March mating, and we're carving late September to early January, and we wean in May, record the first W2 in April, record the second one in May on or at the same uh, just before weaning, you've got two weaning weights. Okay? We can do the same for W4 and W6. So you can do April, where, uh, so you can do April, May this year for the, the weaners, and next year you do the April and May again for W4, and then you can do September and October for W6, for example, if you've got a fixed mating season. However, the system will take multiple weights for mature weight at weaning and cow weight at calving. And again, we are very flexible how we <coughs> take the data. We also have that very simple Excel. 
CAM ID and um, CAF ID, trait W2, date, and weight. Very simple. Very, very important measure, scrotal scars. And please measure all the animals, all the young bulls in that group. Don't give me the scrotal size for the top three bulls and exclude all the others because all I'm going to do is compare those top three bulls with themselves. So let's say I've got 30 young bulls. Well, that's a lot of bulls. Let's say I've got 30 young bulls and the top three have 35, 36, 37 kg, uh, centimeter scrotal size. But the group is 30 and I'm ranging from 25 to 35. And I only send you those three. So what am I going to do in my calculations? I'm going to compare 37, 36, 35 to the average of just 36. Instead of comparing 37 with the average of 30. Okay? So measure all the animals in the contemporary group. Send in all the records. Because we are looking at the relative performance of an individual to his contemporary. Are we clear on that? Okay. Recorded between 300 and 700 days weight, uh, age, uh, it's recommended around 400 days, but I think this is more for the temperate regions where they grow fast, they use the bulls at yearling, uh, so if 600 makes more sense to you, that's fine. There's quite a range of ages that we accept, and to one decimal place, and again, uh, very simple to send it to me. The last of the, well, this penultimate on the performance records, but perhaps the most important, fertility. Any, any operation, fertility is the number one profit driver, and this is our best measure of fertility, days to carving. Okay. And this, to do this, obviously we need a fixed mating season. So if you are doing AI, if you're doing year-round mating or anything like that, that, you can't do this. So this is only for the uh, fixed mating season. And what we want is all the mating should be recorded, including the ones that fail to calf. Okay? And it's quite simple. The cow ID, natural mating, when did the bull go in, when did the bull come out, and of course, your performance group. I mated the head was different to the cows. For example, we can also record pregnancy tests, and then we also need to state any animal that we said went into the mating group that we fated for whatever reason. So it's not a sign that it failed to calf. It left that mating group for a reason. Okay? And at the end of the calving season, you've told it, so you've, you've mated a whole bunch of cows, told us the bull in, bull out, um, it's calving date, and those 10 cows that failed to calve, you tell me they failed to calve. Because that's what the system needs to know to close. Out of those 30 animals that were mated, 20 calved, 10 didn't calve. That information is sent to us, and that information is analyzed, and we'll get EBVs for days to calving, which is our best estimate of fertility along with scrotal circumference. There are other traits that are being looked at um, that we need to consider and some societies are pushing them. Hip height. Very good indicator of mature size and, um, and again if you want to monitor if your cows are getting too big or too small that's very good. Flight score or temperament. Okay, we can analyze that. It's a very simple record to do it. Um, and some breed societies are pushing it. Uh, the Brahmins already have a very good protocol. Uh, and it's quite simple. You sit at the crush, and when you let the animal out, you monitor it, how it's going from, from A to B. And you record it on a score of 1 to 9, if it's nice and calm or if it's very agitated, uh, and you record that. There is a genetic predisposition 
to temperament and if temperament is an issue you can include it and you can select for it or against it. Sheath and naval score, again this is a, of concern to some societies, again it's genetic so we can record it and we can get estimated breeding values and you can use those estimated breed, your selections to fix any issues. There's three traits here that I forgot to put on. Um, meat quality is something that is being looked at. Feed efficiency is the other one, and we've already talked about fertility. So feed efficiency and fertility, uh, uh, meat quality, very expensive. Well, the feed efficiency, the equipment to do it is, is very expensive, but it's been done. And uh, meat quality, of course, you kill the animal. Yeah, okay. Out, art, uh, RTU ultrasound, thank you. So this is something else that's been, um, that is being pushed very heavily in Namibia, South Africa, and we've had one breeder look at it. Uh, it's fancy equipment, and, you need, and it needs a technician who knows how to read this. But with ultrasound, you can measure the fat over the eye muscle and the eye muscle area, so you're getting more information on the, on the carcass, carcass trait. So that's a, that's a, a difficult and expensive thing to measure. Um, meat quality, you need to kill the animal, take a section of, from the ribeye area, send it to the labs to do analyses. So these are very expensive, difficult to measure, and, uh, but they are being collected so that we get a, a better profile of the estimated breeding values of the animals. So that's, I'm going to stop here um, and I'm going to ask Craig to take over the second half of the talk from, from here. I hope uh, what I've given you has been clear and please, at any point you need clarification, just stop us. Thanks, Craig. Okay. Uh, all right, so all right, as we discussed before, okay, uh, DNA samples. That was one of the things that popped up when we were talking about how to ensure that an animal is properly registered. So what we're just going to discuss now is basically why we take that sample and what it's used for. So what we currently use it for is parent verification. So we're talking about multi-size. So you've got a group of three bulls, you don't know who the actual parent is. Um, and this is one way of confirming that, yes, such and such a bull is the proper parent of this calf that was just born. Uh, another way is just also to ensure that it's a proper stud animal. It's not from an outside bull that, for instance, jumped the fence or something like that. Uh, and they can properly confirm to any possible buyer or ensure that when you're using that bull again or its progeny that, that, that you're continuing the correct uh, pedigree stud lines uh, for its progeny. So what we currently use are microsatellite markers. So I'm not going to discuss that right now, but it's essentially uh, a type of something within the DNA uh, that we use that's passed on from a parent to a calf, and because those have shared, uh, they're shared between the parents uh, and their progeny, we can tell, yes, that this calf belongs to uh, this parent. Okay. Okay. And for that, we need to take a sample from both the calf and from the parents. So, other or, uh, the parents need, say you've already done uh, this microsatellite uh, parent verification for the calf when it was younger, for its parents, that calf will now have a profile at that lab that can be used for when it has progeny, essentially. Okay. So yeah, once the DNA sample has been processed, so whether or not it was a calf or a parent, once it's been processed, it's got a profile on that lab and can be used for future progeny, verif well, parent verification for future progeny. Okay. All right. We take several, well, currently three different types of samples. Okay. 
to store at the ZHP offices. Uh, the most common one is the pulled hairs, 20 to 30, with the follicle, so with that uh, bit at the end, uh, that's where the actual DNA is, not in the hair itself. So you want to make sure you pull it and you get the, that tissue uh, that comes with the, with the hair. Because if you just cut it, there's no DNA in there. So make sure you take 20 to 30 so you have a good, uh, good sample size for processing and can be processed several times if needed. Uh, what we currently have are envelopes uh, with animal details written on, and those can be sent to the lab. Uh, what we're kind of moving to, uh, as some of you might know, are these specialized hair cards. They're basically these hair cards. You take the hair, you put them in, you flatten it so that the hair is secure. It can't be opened by anyone else. In order to process it, they actually have to take um, punches. Of this, of this card, so there's no handling or any cross-contamination with any other types of DNA, whether it's human or other types of hairs. Um, another type of DNA sample is a tissue sample. So there's specialized tags where you, when you put the tag in, it takes a section of tissue uh, and places it in a vial with a preservative in it, and because of vial is fairly small, the animal ID is written on it uh, and can be linked up uh, with the actual animal details itself. Okay. Uh, currently, if anyone's with Nurture uh, Finance, this is how they currently take their DNA sample uh, uh, in conjunction with their electronic ID. And because you've got those two things, you can always identify uh, the animal should, should something go wrong. So you've got the DNA sample. Uh, in case the animal loses all its IDs, identification, ear tags fall out, brands wear off, uh, or overwritten. Once you've got a DNA sample stored at ZHB, uh, we can take that sample itself, and you can take a sample from the animal, and you can confirm the, the ID as well, um, that the animal is what you say it is, even if all possible visual identification is lost. And it's also important when. Ah. Yeah, I mentioned that to, when you register your car, you must get a head <coughs> into you. The car cannot go from passport up to register, regardless of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like Phil was saying, um, that's one of the criteria for moving an animal from calf book to fully registered we need to have that sample on hand uh, for parent verification and for animal identification. Like I said, if it loses all its visual IDs for whatever reason, uh, for instance, it was stolen and they cut out everything and uh, uh, defaced the brand, uh, there's no way that they can change an animal's genetic structure. So once you take a sample of DNA and we have a sample on hand, we can match the two. Um, so inspections uh, okay, carried out annually according to the Breed Society standards. So um, yeah, it really depends. Uh, Brahmins, Tulis all have their own different criteria of when and how animals should be inspected. Okay? And basically it's for all animals in calf book and potential Appendix A animals. So there's Appendix A animals that are sitting there as commercials. This is when they could possibly be moved to Appendix A uh, registered animals. Okay. Uh, at ZHB, we can generate the inspection lists. So we'll generate one for the calf book animals, and there's a separate one for the potential Appendix A animals, if, if you need one. Uh, okay. And they can be separated by sex. So if, if the inspections are carried out in the bulls and the cows separately, well, heifers separately, uh, this can be of very convenient rather than having to go searching through your entire herd list, essentially. Okay, okay. so uh, as we said earlier, all new cars are entered into the ZHB system as calf book or commercial. So, what we want is for all potential of stud animals, so if they've got fully registered parents, they should come in as calf book. 
even if you don't want them to be stud animals in the future, you're planning to remove them, uh, you can do that at a later date. But if they can potentially be stud animals, they should come into calf book. And they can always fail them later or move them to commercial at a later date. Okay? Uh, but if one or both parents are unknown or commercial, that means that the <coughs> calf should only come in as a commercial animal. Because you can't verify its pedigree or you have no idea of its pedigree, uh, or its pedigree doesn't support it being a stud animal, it should be in commercial. Okay, and for foreign breeds, okay, so, so Tuli, uh, Mashona, uh, Nkone, all the indigenous breeds, they allow for non-SP males, so they can have appendix A, B, C males. However, other breeds don't allow that, uh, unless they want to change it. Um, so basically, any non-SP males for foreign breed, for instance, Brahmins, they can only enter, be ever entered as a commercial animal. And short of some sort of agreement within the society, that's most likely where they'll stay. Okay. 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 So inspections that take place uh, once the animals reach a certain age, as determined by the breed society. So all animals in calf book and potential appendix A's can be inspected at that age. Okay. And if it passes inspection and has a sample of its DNA stored at ZHB, then it can be upgraded to registered. So it will go from calf book to registered, CB to reg. Okay. However, if it fails inspection, it will be downgraded to commercial. And that record of that failed inspection will be uh, recorded against uh, the animal. And as I said earlier, if it could potentially be a stud animal and it's come into calf book, but you wanna, you don't intend for it to ever be a fully registered animal, you could always fail it uh, before it gets inspected and say that you just want it to be a commercial animal. And therefore we have a record um, that despite it being a potential stud animal, you want it as a commercial. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do you mean for inspections or? Okay, so upon request, we'll generate an inspection list for you. Uh, however, we um, most people have the inspection list. Uh, we'll send them out if they want one, because um, that way they at least know which animals are on our system uh, and which, so they can see any gaps. Uh, otherwise. We are comfortable if you send your own list saying this ID inspect was inspected. Um, however, that might run into the problem of is the animal in our system, is it on our system with the correct data, that kind of stuff. So ideally the inspection list should come from us, but we do accept um, your own ones. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you can just, whenever you do inspections, um, it doesn't have to be once a year, it can be uh, whenever you're planning to do them. <coughs> yeah. uh, any more? Yes? That would come in as a commercial. Okay, because... Uh, okay, so only new cars with where both parents are fully registered. So they have passed inspection uh, and they're, they're, they're no longer in calf book themselves. They are fully registered. That means their cars can come in uh, into calf book. However, uh, if the parents are unknown, commercial or I should say still in calf book, uh, the, that means that the calf will come in as a commercial animal. However, if you Ideally, you, you should inspect an animal before you start recording its calves. Uh, it should be fully upgraded uh, to register before you start producing calves uh, with that animal. Other? Uh, that means it will most likely be treated as Appendix uh, A because one of its parents is a commercial, essentially, or an unknown animal. 
Uh, any more questions regarding inspections? Um, okay. So, regarding inspections and breed standards, each breed society has their own rules. So, for some breed societies, they can be self-inspected, uh, you can get a fellow breeder, or some might have a designated inspector within that breed society. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's unique to each breed society, there's no... Uh, uh, and make sure you... You, you, know the, you know the rules uh, beforehand or you know someone that knows the rules to do, to do inspections for you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Levulous. Okay. So each year, because uh, the ZHB uh, curates the data of all the stud breeders and uh, record, maintains their records, uh, records their performance data, does analysis, all that, uh, that Basically, that needs to be funded, and that's done through levies. Uh, okay, and basically, that's done according to your the amount of animals you have, uh, as well as a standard uh, levy herd levy uh, on top of that. So you have your herd levy, and then plus however many registered or calf book animals you have that were born before the previous year. For instance. Uh, 2022 levy list will include all animals born before the 1st of January 2021. And that only applies to your calf book and registered animals, active animals. So you can have as many commercials or uh, commercial animals as you want. Uh, those, aren't levy list. those aren't levied because they won't be producing any calves and ultimately they're just there uh, for, at your own discretion. Okay. Uh, we can generate a levy list in PDF format or in Excel format. Uh, most people find that the Excel, Excel format makes it easier to go through it uh, and add your own notes to it. However, the PDF format is quite readable. Uh, especially if you print it out, you can easily make marks on it. Uh, however, what we Okay, if you have been keeping up with your birth notifications, there really shouldn't be any missing animals on your levy list. Okay, so, okay, so members need to confirm that the animals that should be there are there and that the details match what you have. So you need to make sure that a cow's progeny number, uh, however many times she's calved, that's accurate, the ICPs are accurate, the uh, age of first calving is accurate, you need to confirm that all the details are there so that you can catch something before it starts snowballing and ends up messing up all your data because you're suddenly looking for uh, four-year-old dam, I mean four-year-old calves that with too many animals is a cancellation report. So we just need to know which animals need to be removed from your levy list, which ones are no longer active in your herd for whatever reason. Okay. Uh, returns are due by the end of February, so we send them out at the beginning of the year. Uh, and yeah, ultimately you should have confirmed that your levy list is all square, the details are all square, all, all the animals that should be there are there. And as I said, uh, you have a herd levy. Um, Mario said it was 100. 
100 and then per capita so per uh, per capita so however many animals you have on that levy list uh, four dollars if we capture your data electronically uh, five if we do it manually so another incentive for sending everything uh, in an electronic format so either via Excel or Herdmaster because it makes everyone's job a lot easier yeah any anyone got any further questions on levelless are we happy okay 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 and then outside of levelless we have herdless so as I was talking earlier levelless only cover basically two-year-old animals that are either in calf book or fully registered over your herd list can include everything so commercials young animals um, yeah so everything that we have under your herd that's active will show up on a herd list okay we can generate it whenever you want okay you just need to ask us and we can do it it's a very easy job and we can send it back to you in uh, a PDF format or in an Excel format depending on what you want it you want it for okay uh, lists all active animals and their details so it's got all the animal details in there uh, so it doesn't always have to be all active you can also list specific animals depending on their registration status their sex their calving year so if you wanted all commercial animals born in 2021 uh, we can do that for you or all male commercials for instance you can do that uh, you just need to give up. So that's one way of checking up on your, your herd, making sure that all the details are being recorded correctly. Um, uh, otherwise, you can do it yourself, and that's where Internet Solutions comes into play. Okay. So inter Internet Solutions, uh, that's the website. Okay. Yeah, a fairly simple one, lrf.co.za forward slash Zimbabwe. And that's basically an online searchable database for all animals um, on the ZHV system, for all breeds. Okay, so it is separated by breed, so every breed society has their own database that anyone can search through. So if you're planning on purchasing a bull um, from someone else and you know the ID, uh, you could most likely, if they've if they are registered with ZHB and they say that the animals is registered with ZHB, you could find that animal online and look at all its details. Okay. Okay, ZHB members, they can request a login password for their member ID. And that basically gives them they can basically refine their searches down more to their herd as well. So they, they can use additional criteria when going through their own herd so they can do uh, extra checks on their own herd. Uh, also, uh, it gives them access to the EBV reports, outlier reports, levelless data extracts, and several other doc reports that I don't know offhand. But there's a lot of functionality in having a login for uh, your internet solutions um, and that's basically upon request anyone anyone that's registered with ZHB can just send an email I'd like uh, access to internet solutions please can I have a login and we'll generate that password for you uh, unique to your member ID and once you log in for the first time you can uh, change that password to whatever you want it to be yeah. so yeah any additional queries on internet solutions? Or, yes, Phil? Um, how does that compare to what we do today? Um, oh, yes, in fact, if you go to www.agribsa.co.za forward slash Zimbabwe, it redirects you to LRF. Since LRF were, has basically taken over, uh, well, merged everything, it's all under this banner now. So even if you go to the old um, website, it will just take you to this one now. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, AgriBSA used to be, uh, what was it, the old? Um, yeah, essentially. Before they, or we all merged uh, ZHB, AgriBSA, uh, and yeah, into LRF. Uh, yeah. The livestock... Um, 
registration page. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, don't worry too much about old um, URLs. They, they might be made inactive at some date, but uh, for now, they, they'll just redirect you to LRF. And I feel this is a lot easier to remember as well. Uh, okay. Okay. All right, breed runs. So basically, a breed run. Okay, they produce EBVs, but what are EBVs? Your estimated breeding values. This is basically the main reason why we do all this performance recording, uh, mating details, capture, everything, DTC. All the, all the traits in performance recording are basically for the goal of producing accurate EBVs, these estimated breeding values. So what they are, an animal's breeding value, it's, it's genetic merit. So if you take out everything, environment, um, uh, basically how it's treated, what it's got left is it's pure genetics and that's what we want to look at because that's what gets passed on no matter what to its progeny. Okay, so half comes from each parent. Okay, and basically we get these breeding values by looking at its performance data and the performance data of its relatives. So it's a big statistical analysis looking at everything, how the animals are linked to one another, uh, how they perform within their contemporary groups, you essentially create these estimated breeding values, hence the estimated version, because they're not known until uh, it produces many, many, many uh, progeny. Okay, uh, so yeah, so for those of you that have seen EBVs before, you know that they've got those plus or minus values, so basically those plus or minus values are a difference between the individual animal's genetic merit or genetics, and it breeds genetic base. So this base was calculated in the 90s, so it's, it's not too important to look at, well, to, want, to know what this base was, for whatever reason, but you, the only way you can really compare EBVs is by looking at, does it have a higher plus number or then another animal's plus number. So you can only really compare EBVs uh, against one another. You, there's no looking at a base or an average or something. You have to comp it's basically for comparing two animals against each other to see which one has the better uh, genetic merit for that trait. Okay? And they're not absolute either, so it's not in terms of if it's a plus three birth weight doesn't mean that's plus three. You'll see how your herd average EBVs uh, compared to the breed's average EBVs. You'll see there's graphs that will show you how your herd is doing compared to the entire breed, whether or not, and uh, whether or not, how, how you want to start treating your herd based on that uh, as well. Okay, uh, there's also a percentile bands table. So this is basically lists uh, from, in, I believe, 10% increments. So you have your top 10% animals. Uh, what kind of values their EBVs will, will be. So you can see if your animal has an EBV uh, that matches that, you know that, that, that your animal has the top 10% uh, uh, for that trait is within the entire breed. So it's a bit difficult with that example. Uh, but yeah, basically shows how well your herd is doing as well. So you can easily see okay, my animal is a top animal, or it's an average animal, or it's for some reason it's below average, you can use those percentile bands uh, to figure that out. Okay, so after breed runs, uh, occasionally uh, they'll notice their performance record is either much higher or lower when compared to the records within its contemporary group. Again, it comes back to this contemporary group. Um, it doesn't matter if your uh, animals have higher records than uh, another member because one, they only get compared within that contemporary group. So for some reason, you've got a contemporary group where most animals have a birth weight of about I don't know, 30 kgs or so, and then all of a sudden, you've got one that's 40. That animal or that record would get flagged as... Maybe he did something wrong. Maybe 
you accidentally type four instead of three, uh, so that record gets flagged during the breed run as an outlier, meaning that it's not included in that current breed run. It gets skipped over because it would end up throwing uh, basically the calculations askew. Um, okay, it could be an error in your recording, so you could have accidentally typed the wrong number, um, or it could be valid. You could have just had a really, really big cough for some reason. Okay, so what you need to do is when you have that report, you need to go through it, you need to check, you need to either correct the value or say, yes, this is correct for this animal. And then send that back to us so that we can either validate the record or uh, update it so that's accurate. And then once that happens, in the next breed run, it will be included and you'll get more accurate EBVs for that animal. Yeah, so anyone wanna, want further information on EBVs and breed runs in general? Or are we all happy for now? Okay, great. Okay. So, we've been discussing uh, contemporary groups. Uh, one, one way in which contemporary groups are automatically split, can be split, in uh, breed plan is by calendar year. If you haven't specified uh, that's part of a, that they are actually a contemporary group and we're all born at the same time or around the same time. Uh, and that's where calving year versus calendar year comes into play. So let's say you do year-round calving. Uh, animals that are born in one year are treated differently than animals born in the, than the following year. Even if it's 31st of December, 1st of January, animals are split right down the middle they're treated as one contemporary group to the other. So you have two contemporary groups even if they're born a day apart. However, if you have a fixed calving season that doesn't end exactly in December, say it runs from, uh, yeah, yeah, you have a calving season of from October to uh, February, for instance. That's where all your, all, all your calves are born most of the time. Uh, it's been split right right in the middle, but they're all, they've all been treated the same. All their parents have been treated the same. Those are a contemporary group. Uh, you don't want breed plants suddenly splitting those up and basically halving your contemporary groups, making the analysis uh, less accurate. You want to keep the group as big as possible. So what we have uh, in breed plan is we can specify that we want those animals to be treated the same in the car same calving year, essentially. Uh, and what that means is basically members need to tell us, okay, my calving year, uh, my calving season is from October to February, therefore my calving year basically begins in March uh, and runs uh, from, yeah, from March 2021 to March 2022, that's my calving year, okay? So <laughs> basically that means that the calves born within that from March uh, 2021 to March 2022, will be treated all as March 2020, as 2021 animals. Okay. Meaning that their IDs will be 2021, will be 21, uh, start with 21, and their analysis will be treated within the same carving year. Uh, if, anyone could, uh, if you're happy with that. So, does anyone have uh, fixed mating seasons that run between years? Okay. All right. Okay. So, yeah, we've been discussing uh, all the records that we've been taking, all the different events within a cast life, uh, and what should be taken at each each step. Okay. So ultimately, every calf first kind of is born. Uh, that's the first event in its lifetime. At that stage, we need a birth notification from you, okay, with all the various calving details, calf details, mating details, pedigree details. All of that is uh, sent in the birth notification. And ideally, if we can get a DNA sample as soon as possible as well, which will save you trouble uh, down the line. So take a DNA sample when the animal is born, send it to us, um, okay. 
then our next, the next event is 200 days, so essentially weaning, or in this case pre-weaning for the 200 day wait. Okay, record that, send it to us. Uh, next stage, 400 day, uh, 400 day wait is recorded, the yelling wait, uh, possibly take the male calf's scrotal size, otherwise that could be taken at 600 days as well. Okay, 600 days, final wait, full wait, uh, is recorded and sent to ZHB. Okay, so two years, possibly less, depending on the breed society. An inspection takes place and the results of that inspection are sent to ZHB. So, did it pass, did it fail, can we upgrade it from calf book to register? Okay, okay so now you've got a grown animal. Uh, it can now be mated. So for the cow, we record the mating details of... Yeah. Uh, so for natural mating, when did the bull go in? Uh, when did it come out? Uh, who was the bull? So record all those details so that we can uh, take the DTC data from that. Record that, send it to ZHB. Same with the pregnancy test. Uh, which data are taken? Uh, what are the results? Those can be sent to ZHB for DTC uh, data. Okay, and finally, after mating, calving. So that's when the cow's weight of calving uh, is taken. Uh, again, sent to us. And then finally, another, another weight, the weaning at the calf's weaning. That's when you can take the cow's mature weight. So with the calf's 200 day weight, also take the cow's mature weight. Okay, and then finally, depending on how, how long the, the cow is active for, for every single mating, pregnancy, uh, pregnancy test, uh, the weights for mature weight, weight of calving, those are recorded for each cycle, calving cycle, and sent to ZHB. And then finally, uh, when the animal is removed from the herd for whatever reason, is a cow, did it die, was it sold? That's when you send us a fake code and its date. And that animal is finally made inactive in uh, ZHB. And also just one thing that I didn't add here, when we're talking about uh, days to carving, you have days to carving fakes, which is essentially a more specific reason of why a cow was removed from your herd. So for instance, you cull the animal for fertility, under DTC fates, there's a whole list of codes, and for whatever reason, uh, you fated that animal for fertility. They failed to produce enough cars, they have, was this calving interval too high, uh, did something go wrong with it physically, that can no longer produce a calf. Basically, that's when you send the DTC fate as well, in addition to its, its fake code, its cancellation code. Okay. Uh, everyone happy with that? Uh, all right, so now time for the interesting stuff for me. Um, I hope you can you can see the benefit of genomics. Yeah. Okay. So timetable of events. This is everything that you need to send to us, and what we expect from you. Okay. So now genomics, uh, exciting stuff. Uh, lots of talk about it in the past few years. Um, but why exactly is it, and how is it going to help us? Okay, so what we currently do in terms of genomics, we have our, and how we currently analyze it. What we're currently working with are microsatellite markers. Uh, as we discussed earlier, it's how we do parent verification currently. Uh, what actually are they? Okay, so what they are, they're pieces of DNA uh, with repeats and high mutation rates found throughout an animal's DNA. So that basically means they're very, uh, these specific types of repeats that are found m multiple and multiple, multiple places throughout a D an animal's DNA. But one thing to remember is that these uh, repeats and the places where they're found in an animal's DNA are passed along to their progeny, essentially. So if, if you know where these markers are in a sire, they'll most likely be in the same place for its progeny. And that's how we do parent verification. Okay, uh, 
what we're currently using are these false standard ISAG markers, so International Society for Animal Genetics, and they're used for parent verification. So uh, they're, yeah, like I said, specific places, uh, specific repeats. Uh, if the repeats match what's in the parents, they'll be found in the progeny. So just remember that's how, how it works. Okay? Uh, because there's various uh, steps to doing it uh, within the analysis, and each lab can have its own unique uh, steps and calibrations and all, uh, unique set of equipment and all that, it's not very easy to repeat the results between labs. So it's not always possible to get an animal's DNA processed at one lab and then take the results or the profile to another lab without them first sending a, a whole bunch of details as to how they processed the DNA, uh, what steps, additional steps they took, or what... Basically, it's very difficult to standardize these results between labs, but it's possible. But ultimately, if you process the DNA of an animal at one lab and you want to do its progeny, best bet is to send the progeny to the same lab uh, for an easier and faster result. Uh, and also, the actual analysis, because it's, it requires a whole bunch of, um, first go get the DNA out and then process, process it in a certain way, it's very time consuming. And uh, to basically extract the DNA, to cut it up, um, and then to analyze it for those markers. Uh, okay. uh, which is why we have now, people are pushing, these single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, markers. So there, there's multiple, there's lots of them spread throughout an animal's DNA at specific positions, okay? And different variants of these SNPs exist, and they can affect an animal's performance. So these SNPs are found at specific genes, and these genes affect, uh, are what affect an animal's performance. So, if, so one can see that if it has a certain SNP within that gene, it will affect an animal's performance in such a way. And that's kind of what we're working towards uh, uh, with getting this whole big genetic profile for, uh, for breeds and uh, for, for, for entire breeds, essentially, is to find these different variants and how exactly they relate to an animal's performance so that if we find these variants in a new animal, we can make a good estimate as to how their performance will be affected. Okay? Uh, compared to microsatellite markers, they're relatively easy to measure because uh, it's a whole different process um, uh, to actually analyze them. And yeah, they, they can also be used for parent verification because if a parent has these SNPs, their progeny will most likely have the same SNPs as well. But other than parent ver verification, they can be used in other applications. Uh, go, go through here. So they can, one application is generating these genomic estimated breeding values. So what that means, as I discussed, if a trait is linked to a certain SNP, uh, if an animal in the future has that SNP, we'll know that its performance will be similar. Uh, also, because those SNPs are Basically, you can use them to start identifying not just the parents, but we can start looking at siblings, uh, uncles, aunts, grandsires, all that, because these SMPs are more widely spread throughout um, an animal's genome. There's more of them. We can find more accurate pedigrees, uh, meaning that we're no longer going to have gaps in the pedigrees. We can start linking individual animals to each other and how exactly they're related. Okay, so also the benefits of these genomic e EBVs. Okay, so you can take a DNA sample uh, from a young animal before it's produced any performance data. I mean, in some cases, even before it's born. And you can get EBVs for that based on what its DNA uh, is telling us. Uh, you can also get hard to measure traits. So carcass traits, ultrasound traits, feed efficiency traits. Uh, stuff that's very hard and costly to set up, or the animal has to die beforehand, we can get that uh, from these uh, genomic EBVs. 
uh, single sex traits. So we can get mature weight values from uh, a bull or milk production values from e milk EBVs from a bull, depending on its DNA. Uh, like I said, traits that can only be measured off death, carcass traits, uh, or even for animals that don't have performance data. So uh, you just picked up a random animal for some reason, you've taken a sample of its DNA, and all of a sudden you know how it should be performing based on uh, its DNA. Uh, okay, and because of this, all we need is a DNA sample, so you can identify uh, a superior animal very early on. Uh, that allows you to make a selection very early on, uh, which basically shortens the generation interval, uh, which will increase your herd's rate of genetic improvement. So you pick in, you know which size you want to keep, which bulls you want to keep, uh, which heifers you want to keep. You can use those immediately, straight away, first progeny. You know that they, you don't have to wait for their progeny to prove themselves. You know that their progeny will also be uh, superior animals. Okay. And because of that, you don't have to keep waiting and waiting and waiting and multiple years for uh, your herd to improve genetically. You can do it after a single uh, generation even. Okay. Okay. Other benefits of genomics. So because those SMPs aren't, are linked to traits, you can find uh, maybe an animal might not express that trait, but you might know that it could possibly pass that trait down to its uh, progeny. So you'll know if you want a desirable trait and you want that passed down, or undesirable uh, abnormalities. So maybe the cow looks fine, but all the progeny are dying for some reason. You might find, look at genomics, and you might find that she carries a, a, an abnormality that because she was mated with a certain sire that also carries this abnormality, all of a sudden, this, her progeny are no longer viable. Okay? And that, that will help you determine whether or not you want to keep a certain, certain animals around. If they could potentially uh, pass these abnormalities on to their uh, progeny. And vice versa with desirable traits. She might not be, have the kind of traits that you want. But you know if, that you, if you mate her to a sire, with, who's another carrier of a trait that you want, that their progeny will most likely, 50-50 really, 50% uh, chance of having a desirable trait. Okay. So, and again, parent verification. So, microsatellites, markers, what we currently use, those do parent verification. However, SMPs, uh, because SMPs use 200 markers, as microsatellite markers use 12, Basically, the more accurate, so more markers means a more accurate analysis, allowing for parents to be identified even among closely related animals. So you'll be able to tell if, uh, uh, basically, among two animals, brothers, whether or not one or which one is actually the sire of a of an animal. Because uh, basically, microsatellite markers would be found among siblings as well. So there's a chance that you could get a uh, unverified uh, parents between siblings, uh, if, if the siblings are, yeah, the sire. Yet, because 200 markers are used, that means more accurate, uh, even among closely related animals, uh, parents can be verified. Uh, yep. And, yeah, so any additional inf information, uh, just contact us at trace at LIT. Uh, .co.zw because uh, all this information it's documented, it's on the web it's explained in a lot more detail um, yeah and we could possibly find it for you or help you to find it so don't hesitate to contact us right. sure. so just to sum up um, what, what uh, we've just done today, and uh, thanks once again to Philip to facilitating this, and Philip has also uh, organized a camera person to take a video, which we'll put on the YouTube to extend to make sure that as many people as possible get this. Uh, so just to, to assist the camera guy, 
um, with what he's going to put on the YouTube. So we went through a whole summary. What is the, what is the herd book? What's the function of the herd book in terms of maintaining, oh, sorry, the, the Zimbabwe herd book in maintaining the herd book on behalf of the respective societies? System of ID, birth notifications, and uh, request for information, cancellations, transfers, how do animals enter the herd book, how do they leave the herd book, um, performance recording, and the importance of contemporary groups. And while I remembered, uh, Brahman uh, is now entering, uh, uh, starting in, uh, activating cutoffs for fertility. I think it's 20, 20 born animals. Heifers have to, be, have to calve by 44 months. And some of the other societies are starting to look at this. So this is all trying to make sure that we are moving towards what is a stud animal. We are here saying a stud animal is better than a commercial animal, and we're now trying to make sure that we are de delivering what we say. Uh, herd lists, inspection lists, how to use them, a DNA sample, the internet solutions. We think not a lot of use has been made of that, and a lot more could be made of that. Your estimated breeding values coming from your breed runs. Uh, we also went through the timetable of events, the introduction to genomics. Uh, something we didn't really mention is we are moving from ILR2 to ILR online, and there are so much more functionalities that will be coming out of that. Uh, and we, as, as Craig was talking, we made mention of the LRF. Just want to spend two words on, or two minutes on that. The livestock registration. Federation is an umbrella body incorporating all the uh, breeders in South Africa using ILR2. There's uh, six or so breeds. And the Namibian Breeders, uh, Breed Society of so Association and the Zimbabwe Herd Book. So it's an umbrella organization for looking at promoting the Southern African region. And um, while, I'm, while I'm remembering is we've just initiated Southern African Brahmin evaluations, really excited, so we now can compare animals that are bred in Namibia or South Africa with an animal bred in Zimbabwe. We're hoping Simmental will, will be included uh, this month, and we're hoping Simbra will be included in the um, middle of the year, and the Thule's are looking at a combined breed run. So there's quite a lot of uh, exciting news moving in that direction. So finally, grateful thanks to all of you for making it here. Sincere thanks to Philip for organizing this, for pushing this, organizing this, organizing the camera person. And lastly, but by no means least, thanks to the Reed family, Philip, Jess, Linda, and Kelly for hosting us most royally, and I do appreciate it. I hope you have enjoyed the course. And I look forward to any feedback, how you think we can improve this. Uh, we are looking to do this more often, and we are looking to go into more in-depth. Herdmaster, animal breeding, using EBVs, using Internet solutions. So this is the first of uh, what I envisage more courses to come. Thank you very much. From here we're going to go up to where we keep our cattle um, and have a look at the cattle and then we can just discuss certain things that are in here if you guys have questions whilst on the ground. Um, there's Brahman and Tulis there, so if you have another breed society, you still very welcome to come out and have a look, it's up to you. Should we get separated? Um, the way to get to the farm is to go out on the Bulawayo Road. You go past Dabuka, that's the big railway siding on the left hand side. Continue on the main road. We'll go down into a dip. As you come out of, of the dip, there's a lay-by on the left hand side with some two or three big gum trees. And there's a, a sign there, a big sign that says airfield. We'll turn right there. Go on a big 
dirt road for roughly 700 meters and there's another turning to the right. Turn right there and just go for another two kilometers. Uh, you'll get to uh, the handling facilities and all that and everyone will be there. I think if we can meet there by 12 o'clock, we'll, it's, now, it's now 25 past, you guys need to buy a snack or whatever, but let's get out there and then I'll start talking at 12 o'clock and, and, and showing what we do out there. Um, yeah, so thank you and we'll probably just drive off here. I'm going to go buy the butcher and bring some cold water for everyone. Uh, there is water in the fridge, just grab it as you go out, but it is hot out there.